Merci à Radio-Canada d'inviter à faire partie de l'initiative 2017 débutant maintenant. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for uh, this invitation to be part of this discussion. It's a pleasure to be here. As we approach the 150th uh, birthday of Canada, the question I want to pose to Canadians is, where in the world is Canada? I don't mean the question of where on the map is Canada. You would have to be uh, optically, severely disadvantaged optically not to find Canada on the map. And I don't mean where is the world in Canada, because we know particularly in this city that this is a country that uh, it was built by immigrants, where we have large populations of uh, Canadians from many parts of the world. But what I mean is where is Canada in the world making an impact and making a difference and mattering not just for the world but for Canada? Where is the world in Canadians' mental maps? And when I ask the question, where in the world is Canada, I don't also mean the old question of where is our government in the world. I don't simply mean where is our government in terms of UN involvement, in terms of peacekeeping, in terms of membership of the various international forums. All of these are extremely important and we need to stay engaged in the government to government machinery of international economic and political and security relations. But I mean, where are Canadians in the world? Where are Canadian companies in the world? Where are Canadian citizens in the world? Where are Canadian NGOs in the world making a difference? Now, you may think that this is a rather odd question to be asking because we pride ourselves in this country as being uh, a nation that is plugged into the world. We have an image of ourselves as being a country of immigrants, we see ourselves as an exporting nation. We talk about the importance of world markets for this country. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, it may come as a surprise to you that perhaps we are rather less plugged into the world than uh, we imagine. It is, of course, very true that exports as a share of our GDP are very high, and we do indeed depend on access to uh, international markets for our prosperity, for our wealth. But most of our trade is with the United States. Indeed, even today with the recession, the prolonged recession in the U.S. and with a weak uh, U.S. economic outlook, we export something in the order of 70 to 80 percent of our total exports uh, to Asia. We think of ourselves as a country that uh, has lots of inflows of tourists and foreign students, and that's very true. We take in what? Currently, the stock of foreign students in this country is probably in the order of 200,000. This is including both the K-12 to system and post-secondary. But how many of our students go overseas to get experience? Well, let me tell you. Roughly 12% of Canadian post-secondary students spend time abroad in some sort of study abroad exchange or co-op program compared to the United States, which we always put down and look down as the more insular country, which has 20% of its student population that has spent time abroad on some kind of overseas study program. And compared to Germany, which has 33% of its students having spent time abroad on some kind of international program. Our lack of globality, if you will, is uh, not just an intellectual problem. It is a problem that has a very direct impact on the livelihoods, the welfare, the social programs of this country. To take just the example of oil and gas, energy exports, we are a, uh, blessed with uh, tremendous resources across a range of commodities, but particularly energy, not just oil, not just gas, hydro, uranium, and many other energy assets, including some of the world's best renewable technologies. But when it comes to oil and gas, we are so dependent on the United States, to be precise, 99.9% .9 of our oil and gas exports go to the US, that we are suffering from the decline in the U.S. market, the slowdown in economic growth, and the prospect, the very real prospect, 
a good prospect, I should say, that the United States could be energy self-sufficient within the next 10 or 15 years. And as a result, the price of Canadian oil in particular is suffering a discount of anything between $15, $40, $50 dollars per barrel. There is an imperative, just in this narrow example, for Canada to be more global and not to simply look at Canadian or North American markets. Just a very small example of how Canada may think of itself as being in the world, but how we are not quite in the world uh, more broadly beyond North America. And the one issue above all that I want to draw to your attention today is in the question of people movements. You know, we think of ourselves as being global mostly because we have a large population of new Canadians who have come from uh, many different countries. It is part of the Canadian psyche to see ourselves as a country of immigration. We pride ourselves on multiculturalism. Roughly, what is it, uh, 300,000 new immigrants come to this country every year, more or less 1% of our population. If you add up the numbers over 10, 20 years, that's a very big number. And there's no question that we have been a welcoming country to inbound immigration. What you may not know quite as well is that we are also a country that sends people out into the world. We are an emigrating country as well as an immigrating country. And research at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada has found that we have perhaps 2.8 million Canadian citizens living outside of this country. You can do the math, 2.8 million is something like 9% of the population. That percentage is higher than the shares, the equivalent shares of Australia, of the United States, of India, of China. We are a country with a large footprint of Canadian citizens abroad, more so than many of these countries that are traditionally thought of as countries with large overseas populations. Where are these people? Where are our Canadians abroad? Well, it will not surprise you to know that the United States is the uh, largest single destination, and I'm not referring to snowbirds, people who just go for a couple of months. We are talking about Canadians abroad who spend more than a year at a time, so they are uh, long-term residents, shall we say. Roughly 1 million of the 2.8 million Canadians abroad are in the U.S., but Asia is a huge second with, we think, something in the order of 600,000 Canadian uh, citizens living across Asia, mostly in what we call Greater China, which would include Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the People's uh, Republic. What is interesting about the Canadian population in Asia is that many of them are foreign-born. In other words, they are themselves recent immigrants to Canada who, after a number of years, chose to go back uh, to Asia for professional, for family, for a variety of reasons. Now, this is problematic, problematic to some people. And I know some of you in the room will be thinking, well, these are either losers because they couldn't hack it in this country, or they're disloyal. Well, let me tell you that's not true. They are not losers because in our studies, what we have found when we compare the cohorts of those who have left versus those who have stayed, the ones who have left are by far more successful in their professional careers and in the terms of the incomes they are earning. And that stands to reason. They left because opportunities were terrific for them in Hong Kong or in China or the Philippines or India or Japan or Korea, whatever it might be. And we have to celebrate them rather than to think of them as either losers or disloyal. What does it mean for Canada? Well, did you know that one of the largest school districts in this country is outside of Canada? We think there are perhaps 70, 80,000, 70 to 80,000 students learning a Canadian curriculum, one of the provincial Canadian curriculum outside of this country. Most of them in Asia. This is the phenomenon of Canadian schools abroad that was set up specifically to uh, provide Canadian education to expatriates as well as to uh, foreign students who want 
to learn a Canadian curriculum. And why does it matter? It matters because Canadians abroad are an important diplomatic bridge for this country. They are representatives of the country. They provide people-to-people, uh, -people, cultural, social, and business links that benefit them, of course, but we think also benefit this country. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, though, is that we have an ambivalent attitude towards Canadians in the world, and particularly towards Canadians abroad. It rubs us the wrong way to think that we are a country that not just receives immigrants, but also sends people out into the world. And this is most true when we, when we encounter the discussions about uh, ethnic minorities in this country. There's a term that is used in the media and by politicians and in the chattering classes called the Canadian diaspora. And when somebody talks about the Canadian diaspora, they're referring to people like me, Chinese people or Indo-Canadians or Filipinos or Haitian Canadians, whatever it might be. They're talking about minorities who have moved to Canada and formed diaspora communities in this country. Now that is mistaken. A true Canadian diaspora is the Canadian that is abroad, not foreign communities in Canada. If we've come to Canada, we're Canadians. If Canadians go abroad, that is the true Canadian diaspora. And yet the discussion in this country, whenever there's talk about a diaspora, is about what's here, not what is abroad. So what I'd like to encourage all of us to think about in the years leading up to the 150th anniversary is how we can, first of all, better recognize the importance of Canadians abroad. Secondly, how we adjust our policies, our attitudes, our uh, strategies in business, in government, in universities, and so on, to tap into the asset that we have abroad, that is the Canadian community living uh, across the world as Canadian citizens, creating benefits for this country. Let me conclude with a perhaps uh, rather technical uh, example of um, uh, national income accounting. Now, I've put you to sleep already, I'm sure. In, in economics, you know, we have a concept uh, that distinguishes between gross national product and gross domestic product. You're, of course, familiar with GDP and so on. GDP is the amount of goods and services, the value of goods and services that are created domestically. GNP, gross national product, is the amount of goods and services and value created domestically plus the net income from overseas assets. If your GNP is greater than your GDP, what that means is that you have assets overseas, typically Canadian companies that are invested overseas, that are generating revenues, income for the country. That's generally a good thing. I'd like to suggest that in terms of our human capital, in terms of our citizenry, we also have net assets overseas. We have to count them, we have to count the value they create for this country, and then we have to embrace them as part of Canada's future. Thank you very much.